Welcome to another episode of Magic Carpet's Refit. Magic Carpet, as many of you will know by now, is the sailboat that I have bought four years ago, being a total shipwreck. It had fallen off the crane, insurance wrote it off, and during my apprenticeship, so starting with no experience at all, I worked my way up. And uh, now she's afloat and we're sailing on her in the Mediterranean, as you can see in the other episodes. So here instead I'm focusing on the restoration process. Unfortunately, I have not taken videos while I was doing the repair. I've taken tons of photos for myself, uh, which were helpful to rebuild the boat, but I didn't want to make a slideshow just showing photos or talking over them. So I thought I share what I've learned through the process of rebuilding and restoring the boat. So I give you more insights about the whole theory. So you might apply it on one of your projects. So stick with me. If you disagree, have other opinions, another idea, share them with me, please. I am always in the process of learning also, but this worked out really well for me. And also I do work as a boat builder in the boat yard and most of the times this is how we solve things to get professional results. In the previous video, we have focused on the damage, checking out the damage, getting the repair done, more of the hard work, the hard labor with the heavy tools. And as I promised, this video will focus on the surface finish. Once you've got your hole back to strength, you have done the fiberglassing, you wanna get it smooth and shiny again. Specifically on fiberglass, I might have to add also, cause uh, there is many boat materials, there is many more ways on how to do a surface finish. We are focusing uh, more just on fiberglass. The biggest debate here is, are we using gel coat or are we using paint? So that's what I'm going to focus on. Let's dive into the pros and cons first. And if you're still interested after this, stick around and I'll show you the tools that are helpful to prepare a surface finish and uh, afterwards on uh, application methods and uh, all the rest. So let's get into the comparison. Gel coat is nothing else but polyester resin with some thickening agents and coloring pigments. And the benefits of it are to improve durability, to protect the laminate from the environment, reduce fiber pattern, and to provide smooth aesthetics. The most frequently asked question that came up from the last video where I was comparing polyester and epoxy is whether you can use gel coat, which is polyester, on top of epoxy. What we have been taught in school is not to use polyester over epoxy. That is because it cannot create a chemical bond. If you use the same material, polyester with polyester, it will create a chemical bond. It will become one. And instead, by mixing polyester with epoxy, I mean not mixing them, but um, one after the other, they will not get that chemical bond. But still, it doesn't mean that it's not possible. So if you want to use gel coat after epoxy, that is possible. It is all about proper surface preparation because instead of a chemical bond, you can still get a mechanical bond. I don't recommend it because there are things that can go wrong and that's why we've been told not to do it. For example, in the epoxy's hardener, there is amines, amines, these can create problems. So if you don't swipe those amines away from the epoxy after it has cured, polyester is not going to stick to it. So as we said, um, it's all about proper surface preparation. And I don't wanna dive into this much further because um, my question beforehand is, why even bother? I am not keen on using gel coat after I've used epoxy. So yeah, many, they see gel coat as the purity or virginity of a boat, um, that it has to have gel coat again. 
But as I will dive into just now by comparing gel coat or paint, you will see that it's much more labor intense. So as I said, yeah, why even bother? Now to paint, it has those exact same features. But on top of that, it has a greater color retention. Gel coat tends to fade quicker with UV light. And because of that, paint is also easier to retouch. Once you have a small damage and you want to repair that, you go and after three or four years, you pick exactly the same can of paint. You pick your color number and you can use that and it will blend in way better. So here we come to a few of the drawbacks of gel coat. It fades quicker. It doesn't have self-leveling qualities. That means with paint, you try to get it on the surface as perfect as possible. You want it to flow and you don't have to touch it anymore after you have applied it, if done properly. There might be one little two spots where it was running, so there you might have to uh, give it some attention. But with gel coat, it's a whole different thing there you always need to sand it. I don't have experience with spraying gel coat, so, but I'm still pretty sure that you cannot spray gel coat and it will be like paint. Gel coat is much thicker. It has a way different consistency and there is th additives that you can give it to make it uh, runnier, but it still is not as liquid as paint by no comparison. So that is one other draw, big, big drawback. Why? Because you don't have that smooth surface at the end. You have applied your gel coat, but you have to sand it down to get it perfectly smooth. So to me, gel coat makes absolute sense in a female mold. That is when the boat is being constructed at the beginning. I love gel coat. Let me be clear about that. But that is when you are building a boat from scratch. And gel coat is much thicker than paint. So there is a pro. But once this gel coat is 20 years old and it's fading, I don't bother anymore. It's great when you have it, when it's in good condition, you have maintained it, you have a good gel coat, try to keep it that good. But once it's good days are over, I'm not bothering anymore by trying to get good gel coat on. I mean, anymore. Then I just see way more benefits with paint. For example, one big problem, as we said, is matching colors on gel coat is really hard. And that is due to UV light um, since it fades a lot. So here's... Um, the big point again, gel coat is much more labor intense. When we go back to the table with all the tools that we need, I will dive into it further. But as a quick note, once you have applied gel coat, you need to sand it down. And you start with pretty rough grit sandpaper and you work your way down. Like for example, let's say I start dry sanding with 150 grit sandpaper and that is nowhere near to being a smooth finish so after 150 you go to 180 220 280 320 after 400 and then yeah, i might switch to wet sanding 800 thousand thousand two hundred thousand five hundred all the way to 2000 and after that i still have to go over it with the polishing machine which gives it even a smoother sanding the buffing at about 2000 grain and then waxing so you see it's much more labor intense but there are two occasions where i actually prefer using gel coat well prefer or have to in the case of insurance so i don't think this will be a reason for you but me working in a boatyard when it's an insurance case the boat got a damage then you have to restore it to how it was before and I've had to repair huge, huge damages uh, with gel coat. And let me tell you, it is 
one big pain in the ass. So fulfilling an insurance claim, that's one reason. And the other one is when it's small cracks. Uh, let's say very often it happens on your cabin top somewhere, you, or you drop your uh, spinnaker pole on the cabin top, you got one small little hick on the gel coat. Then I do the color matching, I fill it out with gel coat again. And it requires some love, but it can disappear and blend in perfectly. So to wrap this up, this side has stayed pretty much empty, but you can move all of the benefits over to the paint side. And as we have mentioned, it has a greater color retention. You will never get that depth, that gloss, and that same shine on gel coat. You might for one or two years, but it will disappear way quicker. And yeah, also it's way easier to retouch. But mostly I prefer paint because of the labor intensity. It, it involves less steps to get equal, if not better, finish. So to wrap this up in a simple way, if there was gel coat, I use gel coat again, but only limited to small surfaces. If it's becoming any bigger project where I had to fiberglass a lot, I tend to use paint. And so I did with Magic Carpet. Magic Carpet was such a huge surface and it still was a lot of work. So I was not going to bother to apply gel coat and make it even more labor intense. Here is what I used to restore the huge surface that I had to work with. Basically, I made my fairing compound myself. And as a resin, I used epoxy. And then I combined it with the West System filler. What worked the best for me was the 407. It's a low density filler. It is a mix of um, glass spheres um, and uh, other things which make it really easy to sand. Also, the West System 410 microlite is uh, for ultra ultralight fairing. So this makes it even easier to sand at the end. I chose 407 instead. And here is something for application. So we have the very traditional small ones and since I had huge surfaces, there is also bigger ones. But this one was not flexible enough in my case, because I was not putting my fairing compound on flat surfaces, but I was doing it on very curved sections. So basically what worked perfectly for me here is just a strip of plexiglass and make sure one edge is perfectly at a 90 degree angle. Sometimes I cover it with tape so I don't have to bother with cleaning too much. And look at this. It flexes perfectly to whatever surface you have. So that was um, often my method of application. I would put the fairing compound on the hole or on here and then I would press it against the hole with the curvature where it touches everywhere. And then I would work my way up or down. Up works better. This has been really handy for me. But again, it just depends on the size of your repair. You might be happiest with this tool or even smaller. After using my fairing compound, which could also be just a polyester fairing compound, we are using paint. So in my case, I used epoxy and afterwards I used two component paints. And the same is if you would use something like this, like they use a lot in automotive, you use paint again. Since we're almost ready to apply our final coat of paint to finish our project to perfection, we really have to start using blocks. Often you think it's just quick or whatever, I don't have one, uh, but this is really going to change your results. You don't, want to you don't want to sand just by folding sandpaper or doing it with your hands, 
because it will be visible in the final result. So there is many different variations of sanding blocks. There are the cork types. You can make one yourself out of wood because uh, often it depends on the size of the repair also. If I'm doing a very small repair with gel coat, I don't want to sand too much around it since there is the risk that you might just sand a little bit too much and then the fibers become visible. So you might want to create smaller blocks too. So cork, wood, or this one for example, where you can clip in the sandpaper on each side and then you have a big flat pad. So sanding blocks, I'm quite a fan of it and they make your results look way better. And also talking about machines, they change quite a bit on this stage of work. This is one of my favorites, but we are specifically talking about flat surfaces here. When you have a flat surface, you would want to use a sanding machine like this one because it has a perfectly flat surface. Also here, you clip in your sandpaper, attach the vacuum to it, and on we go. Similar to that one is the small triangular version of it. Um, what was it? Uh, var var varnishing a folk boat. One of those with all the planks. This has a smaller pad. And also what's kind of great, when you attach the vacuum to it, it creates kind of a vacuum to stick better to the surface. So it's important that you have it flat on the surface all the time. Uh, so yeah, that's the last machine I've used, for example, on a folk boat just before varnishing again. This is quite a handy tool. The bigger the surface, the better, because uh, it's stabler and yeah, you might not accidentally get that move, which would get um, some damages into it again. There is also this sander and um, let me tell you I love this machine it is a uh, Mirka I believe from Finland the greatest benefit of this tool it's its weight it's about one kilogram that's two pounds so I can do that overhead work for hours and hours well since we do sometimes nine hours a day this tool, I've really fallen in love with it. And the other great benefit of this tool is it, you can work really dust free. It has really phenomenal dust suction. You can, you can see the pad is covered with a million holes. And also we have had a lot of improvements in uh, sandpaper quality, or should I call it design? So often nowadays you use sandpaper which is laid on top of this net and so in combination the Mirka with all of those holes for getting rid of all the dust and this paper it's really pleasant to work with so Mirka this is not the machine you want to use everywhere if I am already at the primer or at the paint stage I would not want to use the Mirka anymore, but then I change to sanding by hand with blocks. I have, it gets just way more careful. A machine still spins at so many RPMs and it's so quick to get um, something wrong. But for the preparation, this is amazing. Also vacuums are very important now. We have uh, many industrial vacuums in here, but um, this is just not to forget about the vacuum. It's a small handy sustainer vacuum by Festool, which I bought after I have uh, sanded a teak deck and um, it proved really handy. So yeah, that is um, another important part of uh, getting a proper surface finish. You want to get rid of all the dust and the dirt and imperfections. 
So it's all about working clean and preparing that surface as best as you can. Now let's switch to sandpapers. There is many different kinds of sandpapers and especially I want to divide them into two groups. Over here on my right side there are the dry sandpapers and over here there's the wet sandpapers. As their name suggests you actually really dip those, you soak the wet sandpaper in water and you only use it by wetting the surface. And instead on the dry sandpaper you use it dry. One of the cons with dry sandpaper is just um, that it gets really dusty and with the wet sandpaper you control that dust. On the other side a con of the wet sandpaper is you don't actually see how the surface will look when it's wet because it has that shine, it has a tiny film of water on it so you always have to dry it out perfectly before you see am I happy with it or is it not quite there yet. There is tons of different grit of sandpaper basically with the dry sanding on the prior video where it was about preparation and the rougher side of things I was um, using all everything up from 40 grit, 40, 60, 80. And when we get to the surface finish, we have everything above that. So everything from 120 going up higher. And also it is important to use every one of them, every kind of sandpaper, one after the other to get to the smooth surface finish. For example, if I'm using 180, then I'm switching to 220, 280, 320, 400. Those are the ones that I use the most. There are some cases where you can jump from 180 to 280 and it won't be visible, but if you still see the scratches that you did with 180, that tells you to make smaller jumps and to use another grid sandpaper in between. So there is many exceptions and ways to do this, but pretty much that's the theory. You do small steps, you get rid of all the scratches you had from the paper before until moving on to the next one. With wet sandpaper, you might have wondered why they have different grit numbers. So here, a 180 is way different than a 180 in dry sandpaper the numbers go up way higher with the wet sandpaper and roughly I have taught myself that it's about double. If we are talking of 400 grit on a dry sandpaper and then I want to switch to wet sanding then I take 800 grit. More or less that's what we use. It's about twice as much. Because often when I am doing a gel coat repair I switch to wet sanding and then I, after dry sanding to 400 I switch to 800 wet and I work my way up from there. So let's continue here with wet sanding 800, after it comes 1000, 1200, 1500 and it's hardly noticeable anymore on the 1500 grit sandpaper. It almost looks like a, just a sheet of paper. It's so f fine at the end. So I've put a, a bucket. So I've put a bucket here and the sponge, the same block again, but this is uh, to show that it's wet sanding. Pretty much I sand the surface and you don't always have a clear view of what you see because there is all that wet dust also in the way so have a bucket in hand, um, a sponge, wipe it off and then I'm always sanding, wiping it off, sanding, wiping it off. So it also gets quite messy but in a different way. And here is um, sandpaper by the roll so that's mainly what I used on magic carpet and I have fabricated these sanding blocks myself. This is a very simple way how to make sanding blocks. 
you have this um, pretty much uh, insulation material and and then um, I have uh, quite I use quite big quantities of sandpaper like this I apply it to my block and then it's just endurance and hard work you get that onto your hole and work your way from grit 80 all the way up to getting your smooth surface before applying paint yeah i just thought i'd show you this one because that's what i use mostly small repair the bigger the repair the better starting this way with gel coat after using all those sandpapers you want to use a buffing machine that is nothing else but sanding also by using one of these um, I don't know what it's called in English but it's uh, let me call it a paste um, it's almost like toothpaste in the consistency and it has almost like sand in it so that is equal to about a 2000 grit sandpaper so that makes your surface perfectly shiny at the end and then also what I always use at the very end is uh, wax so for all these products there is so many different brands especially overseas um, but I hope you get the rough idea I am not recommending or uh, suggesting any of these it's just what we have right here and I'm sure you get the idea and as we have said in the beginning the other solution to get a surface finish is gel coat so here I have different kinds of gel coats that I want to dive into here I have a little sample and as you can see it's almost like peanut butter so this makes it really easy to fill out little gaps and cracks but they need lots of attention afterwards you have to send them afterwards instead with paint you would want to fill out everything to the shape you want it to have and then you just give it one thin layer but you gave it its shape already this one you apply and you send it afterwards as we said gel coat is nothing else but polyester resin with some thickening agents to have it like this and some coloring pigments what we use a lot in the boat yard is um, we have different whites but we could also just use one and here we have coloring pigments the yellow one is the one we use the most because um, so many boats they have uh, just different variations of white and believe me even if they all would have used the same white just because of uh, UV and the sun gel coat tends to become yellowish so yeah uh, work your way to the color you have on your hole by mixing in tiniest amounts of those coloring pigments so this is the very labor intense part and try to make enough of it because often we have ran out on a repair and then to do the same color matching again twice it's going to be a challenge gel coat you always have to mix a hardener to it so this is the big bottle but um, in, here in Europe you often see it with these little bottles of MAC hardener and normally you use about one to three percent of hardener but make sure you read the instruction on yours here is a very handy small repair kit that you can buy so you have your gel coat, your hardener, uh, some little aids to apply it. So this is really handy to make small repairs. And then I have top coat here. You might have heard of top coat. Top coat is nothing else but gel coat with uh, paraffin. Or that's how you could make it yourself. Because gel coat always has a sticky finish at the end and that is not a problem since you are working on it you're sending that layer away and then the stickiness goes away 
but often sometimes you want to use gel coat on a surface where you don't bother about it being flat or shiny let me let let's say we are painting the bilge with top coat then we don't bother about the finish so it would be really annoying to have that very sticky gel coat on the surface which um, you could get rid of it with acetone but it's not a very pleasant job so add some paraffin to it uh, less than five percent and you will get a dry surface it will not be sticky so or you buy it in the store and then it's sold as top coat exactly the same product only that one is sticky one is not and then another product is uh, styrene you might want to use styrene in small quantities to make it a little bit more liquid like here this gel coat was sitting around for a while so it became even a bit harder i mix a bit of styrene to it to make it a bit more liquid and easier to work with yeah that was it about gel coat that was basically it about gel coats or you're making your own fairing compound but here is a few more products to end it and I want to make this a complete overview so here we have cleaning materials liquids that we use when the surface is ready to apply your paint or your gel coat this is a um, cloth that we use to get rid of the dust. It's pretty much a cloth which has like wax on it, um, tech rag. So make sure you use this one at the very end after vacuuming so you get a really clean surface. Acetone to degrease. Um, it could be a thinner, it could be anything else similar. And then also, uh, quite important, um, this is silicone remover. You can get quite into trouble when you have silicone into something you want to paint. So make sure you clean the surface well. And now here, I don't want to go specifically into the different kinds of paints because there is so many. Uh, I Personally, on Magic Carpet, I wanted to go for top quality. I used two-component polyurethane paint, which worked really well. But depending on the job, you might want to go with one component, which I find totally fine in the interior. But still, I used two-component everywhere. You might want to use a filter. As you notice, um, on the surface finish, we are working always a bit cleaner and dust free we're filtering things and and here about the application method you can spray it on or you can use all kinds of different rollers so many of these rollers they tend to fall apart make sure that switch them out before or you get something a bit more expensive uh, higher quality which um, are designed for this purpose applying all these methods working clean um, anti-silicone acetone cleaning the surface wetting out the floor making sure no dust arises uh, the right amount of uh, thinners in your paint so you get it exactly how you want it and temperature and then there is nothing in the way to get the perfect finish two more things before finishing um, i thought this goes into the same chapter because we also want a surface finish be below the water line so below the water line we use epoxy uh, an epoxy paint roughly let me explain it this way if it is fibers exposed then we use gel chill 200 and instead if we have anything else on this surface like mostly we have gel coat 
then we can go directly on it with VC tar. But basically they're both epoxy paints, but remember if it is fibers, fiberglass sticking out, use gel gel 200, it sticks way better to it. And instead, if it is gel coat, we can go straight to VC tar. So that's how I finish surfaces below the waterline before applying my anti-fouling paint. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Give us a thumbs up, subscribe, and leave your comment below. Any suggestions on what we should cover? Is something still unclear? Let me know. And the camera girl is going to quickly come and say hello yeah, yeah, yeah. and let you know what, um, what kind of other videos we have on this channel. So the Magic Carpet Restoration Series, which this video is a part of, is coming to an end, but we're always open to suggestions. If there's more specific parts of Magic Carpet's restoration which you would like to see, please do let us know. Another mini-series we have going on right now is about my first sailboat, actually, that I got when I was 18 years old and I was still living in Canada. Um, that's been a really fun little mini-series for me to put together and incorporates a lot of aspects of storytelling. Yeah. And then we have the main videos of this channel, which are all about our adventures on magic carpet currently in the Mediterranean and uh, we're going to make some announcements pretty soon about what our future sailing plans are so good plans that's our channel please subscribe yes hit the notification bell yeah okay that's all bye bye <laughs>